morning and welcome to Grace Baptist Church. If you'd like, you could go ahead and turn your Bibles to Galatians chapter 1. We'll be reading that here in just a moment. If you are a guest with us today, when you came in, you should have been handed one of these, a bulletin. It has in it a guest registration form, uh, front and back. If you would fill that out and then either leave it on your seat or place it in the box in the back, we would appreciate that so that we could have a record of your visit. Uh, nobody's going to show up on your doorstep unexpected. I will probably give you a phone call just to say thank you for visiting with us this morning. We'll also send you some information in the mail. <clears throat> Galatians chapter 1, 1 through 10. Most of Paul's writings when he writes to uh, people in the, in the New Testament in the, his letters started uh, fairly uh, cordial. Uh, and some kind of greeting. Even the, if you read 1 Corinthians, he starts out uh, that text with all the problem the Corinthians had. He starts out complimenting them and calling them saints and talking about their salvation. But Galatians begins very, very differently than a lot of his letters. And it was because they had begun to abandon the gospel. And we're going to talk more about that here in just a moment when we look at 1 Timothy today. But this is one of the texts that reminds us of the centrality of uh, and the foundational nature of the gospel. That is something that we have to make sure uh, that we get right as a church. And so here's what Paul writes to the Galatians as they begin to walk away from the gospel and telling people that they had to follow certain practices to be saved as well as have faith. And he begins to go back to the, the doctrine of salvation by grace alone, through faith alone. He says this, Paul, an apostle, not from men nor through man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead, and all the brothers who are with me, to the churches of Galatia, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to deliver us from the present evil age according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel, not that there is another one, but there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed. For am I now seeking the approval of man or of God? Or am I trying to please man? If I were still trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. Let's pray together. Father, <clears throat> we are reminded through this text of the foundation that has been laid for us through your son Jesus and his salvation that we receive by grace alone, through faith alone, in him alone, that which we refer to as the gospel. Lord, we long to be a gospel people. We long to be a people who speak the gospel to others, the pure, unchanged gospel, which if we change it is really no gospel but another gospel, as Paul has said. Lord, but also to be people who live out the gospel. That when we say that Christ has come and we have been forgiven and we have been redeemed and we have been changed, that our lives reflect that. We are grateful for your patience with us in that. We know, Lord, that change sometimes is slow. It does not always come in the areas that we desire or the others desire around us, but nevertheless, the promise is there that through your spirit, it takes place. And so, Lord, we want to make sure as a church and as individuals and as families, we get the gospel right. Today, there are many places where people are gathered to worship, to hear your word, and to expect to hear truth, and yet the truth is not given. The gospel has been changed it has been modified, it has been ignored, it has been seen as a secondary issue. Lord, I pray that you would protect those people in those places from the, that false teaching and the heresy that exists there. Lord, that they would recognize it and do whatever it might take to make sure that truth is preached in those congregations. Lord, I pray for pastors that they would not stray from the gospel, that through the discipline of their own spiritual lives, and through the discipline of just preparing to, to preach week in and week out for their people, that you would hold them close to the gospel, that they would be reminded of the importance of it. They would not stray, and certainly they would not lead the people astray whom you have given them to serve uh, and to teach and to lead. Father, I pray that we would be wise enough to know the difference between the false gospel and the true gospel when we hear it. 
Lord, that we would be courageous enough to stand up where there is a false gospel. Father, that we would be patient enough to try and recognize, is it a false gospel? To ask the questions, to not necessarily assume things, Lord, but before we make accusations to other people who may indeed be brothers and sisters in Christ, we would dig deeper and ask the important questions of the nature of the gospel. Lord, salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, the exclusive nature of Jesus, the deity and the humanity of Christ himself. And Lord, so that we might not neglect or deny true brothers and sisters in Christ, but we might also be able to find those who need to repent and turn to the true gospel and those false teachers who might seek to change the gospel and so damage the church. Lord, keep us close to your word, because as we are close to it, we will stay true to you and we will stay true to the gospel. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. the 
punishment that brought us peace was upon him and by his wounds by his wounds we are healed he was pierced for our transgressions he was crushed for our sins the punishment that brought us upon him and by his wounds by his wounds we are healed we are healed by your sacrifice in the We're just very um, aware of that truth this morning, that it's the blood of Jesus Christ that covers our sin. We thank you for that sacrifice. We thank you for that reminder, Father, from your word. And I pray, as, as Jamie did earlier, that that would be something that we would never compromise, that we would never concede on from the truth of your word. Father, we love you. Thank you for the love that you demonstrated for us in sending your son. In his name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. You would please to first turn to First Timothy chapter four. In just a moment, we'll be reading verses one through ten. <clears throat> there are not many things that I hate more than chasing down a problem with a car. Uh, now it can be a leak that I don't know where exactly where the oil is leaking from. It can be some kind of noise I don't recognize, which I find turning up the radio does help with that a little bit. Um, it can be some kind of mechanical issue, something's not right, the car's not running correctly, but all of a sudden it's running fine and then it's not and you have to chase down this problem, whatever it may be. And those things happen. 
But what I have learned over the years, despite not being much of a mechanic at all, is that the routine maintenance, while it will not necessarily stop these issues from happening, because sometimes these things happen, it goes a long way in preventing a lot of these issues from happening. So regular oil changes and tires, tire rotations, changing of belts and fluids and spark plugs and those things that at certain points in the life of the car need to be done does not guarantee it will always run well, but it certainly helps uh, minimize any problems you may have. And we do know this, the lack of routine maintenance on a car will guarantee at some point in the future you're going to have issues. When it comes to guarding a church from false teaching, the same is true. Sometimes issues arise unexpectedly. Sometimes a false teaching will all of a sudden creep up and we didn't know it was there and you have to deal with it. It was unexpected. But if the church does what I will call routine doctrinal maintenance, then what happens is these issues are fewer and far between. When they do come up, you're better prepared to handle it Maybe not as much damage has been done. But if a church does not do ongoing doctrinal maintenance, then without a doubt at some point down the road, these issues and false teaching are going to creep up. And usually by that time, there's been so much damage done that it can cause extreme harm in the life of the church and the people within the church. We're seeing this in many churches today. What you're seeing is even throughout probably the last 15 or 20 years, Uh, Men that I would have considered 15, 20 years ago, very solid pastors in the evangelical camp, all of a sudden over the last few years seem to be straying away from biblical authority and in turn straying away from the gospel itself. When you look back on their ministries, and I'm not one that really likes to or tries to criticize the, the philosophy necessarily of another person's ministry. When you look back on some of them, what you will find is that over the years, many of them had what I would call probably a more surface level type ministry. There wasn't a lot of in-depth Bible teaching. There wasn't a lot of discussion about doctrine and the application of doctrine and what it meant. It was more of a felt needs, deal with the issues of today type approach. Well, over time, and by the way, sometimes those things need to be dealt with. We all live in real life. We all have real issues, day-to-day problems. The Bible addresses those. Those things can be dealt with. But if that's all that's focused on, you don't build any depth. And what happens is the weeds of false doctrine will begin to take root underneath the surface. And at some point, they begin to spring up. And when they do, it seems that they spring up in great number. And then the pastor and or the church themselves a lot of times will leave what we might consider the orthodox Christian faith. Some may stray away from more conservative issues that that we may find important to us. For example, as Baptists, for example, what we talked about earlier in 1 Timothy of some may start to adopt, uh, it's okay for a senior pastor to be a female, and that's kind of the first step. Others just flat out fall out into heresy and a false gospel. Well, in our text today, Paul addresses one of the main issues for which he's writing this, this letter to Timothy, And it's really the main issue. It is addressing the need to stand up against false teaching. So we've just seen in chapter 3 where he gives qualifications for pastors and deacons. If you go back and read those, you'll see that both of those, he addressed them. They had to be doctrinally sound. That was part of the qualifications. He ends chapter 3 with summarizing the priority of truth and the gospel. And now again, he turns back to Timothy to again to continue addressing this issue of confronting false teaching and the church, and now what he does is he starts to give more specifics. Whereas in early in First Timothy, he just in general addresses that there's these false teachings going on, and and their old wives' tales and their fables. Now he starts to get a little bit more specific about exactly what is happening and what Timothy needs to do to address those issues. So if you'd please stand, I'll read chapter four, verses one through ten of First Timothy. Paul wrote, Now the Spirit expressly says that in later times some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and teachings of demons, through the insincerity of liars whose consciences are seared, who forbid marriage and require abstinence from foods that God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. For everything created by God is good, and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving, for it is made holy by the word of God and prayer." If you put these things before the brothers, you will be a good servant of Christ Jesus, being trained in the words of the faith and of the good doctrine that you have followed. Have nothing to do with irreverent silly myths. Rather, train yourself uh, 
For godliness, for while bodily training is of some value, godliness is of value in every way as it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance. For to this end we toil and strive because we have our hope set on the living God who is the Savior of all people, especially for those or of those who believe. You can be seated. So one of the roles that we continue to see in 1 Timothy that pastors have is to, at least in part, maintain doctrinal consistency and doctrinal truth within the church through a teaching ministry. Now, what I mean by that, at least in part, is that there is a time, yes, to confront face-to-face and directly false teaching in the church. And where it clearly comes up in the church, it needs to be confronted. But there is another side of the pastoral ministry that is often overlooked, as we said we would call routine doctrinal maintenance, where if this takes place, you lessen the frequency of those face-to-face encounters. And that has to do with this ongoing responsibility of preaching and teaching in the church. And that the pastor's primary role in the church is that of his teaching ministry. And when you think of a pastor's teaching ministry, you often think, first and foremost, probably what I'm doing right now. But it goes beyond that. It's the pastor viewing himself and in his role in almost everything he does as a teacher. So he teaches here. If he's teaching a small group, maybe more discussion-oriented, he's teaching there. When he has meetings with leadership, he's teaching there. Not just teaching, you know, how to lead a meeting, for say, in an effective way, but more of on teaching is this, is this is the priority of how we deal with things, and this is what we do, and this is what Scripture says about this. In private conversations with people, and for example, in counseling sessions, it's a teaching ministry. Here's what the Bible says about these issues. And even in what we might call private conversations... Uh, that the first responsibility of the pastor is that teaching ministry, which I will tell you as a, from a personal testimony standpoint can be difficult at times because here's what I've learned over 15, 14, 15 years uh, being here, uh, and that is this, that my primary responsibility toward all of you, first and foremost, is your pastor. I have many great friends here, but my primary responsibility toward you is first and foremost is the pastor. And I'm always first your pastor before I'm your friend, because that's my job. That's what God's called me to do in this church. And so a pastor has to remember that in everything that he does. It can't, it's not that he can't have personal relationships or have conversations about things that aren't spiritual. It's that he understands that in any situation, his first and primary responsibility is teaching truth. It's correcting. It's challenging. It's pushing people toward Scripture. Well, let's look through this text, and the first thing we're going to see as Paul addresses these false teachers is that these false teachers are addressed as Timothy concerning these false teachers, is that these false teachers are pawns of Satan. Now, Paul does not mix words here when he declares the source of the false teaching that's infiltrated and looks like has already infiltrated the church. He makes it very clear. These people are pawns of Satan. So he identifies the heresy in verses 1 through 3. Now, in verses 1 through 3, we're going to see four different things here. We're going to see how the false teachers are identified, what leads to that. Number two, we're going to see the origin and the spiritual nature of the heresy. In other words, where did it come from? Number three, the character and the nature of the false teachers. And number four, the specific false teaching that was being promoted in the church. What were the specific issues, at least in this context? So let's look first at verse one. We'll see the first of these, the false teachers being identified or how they're identified and the origin and the nature of the heresy. In verse one, he says, now the Spirit expressly says... That in later times some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and teachings of demons. So Paul says it's been identified, or these teachers are being identified, that the Spirit has expressly said said to him that this is the case. So what does that mean? Well, it is possible he's referring back to example Matthew chapter 24, where Jesus himself said that many will fall away and betray one another and hate one another. And Jesus, even in his ministry, talked about false teachings. And, of course, in the Trinitarian relationship between God, the Father, and the Spirit, all God, all preexistent from all time. It's possible he was referring to Jesus at that point and the Spirit of Christ, Spirit of Jesus, Spirit of God in Christ as part of the Trinitarian relationship and saying, this is what Jesus said. But it's more likely what he's saying as an apostle that he had this unique and special revelation that apostles had that we do not have anymore. And here he's writing scripture, and he's basically saying from his perspective, look, God has just told me as an apostle, this is what's going to happen. He says in these 
latter times or later times that these false teachers will come up and they will depart from the faith. Well, what are the later times? Well, there's, the Bible uses later times in a lot of different scenarios. But here specifically, he's simply talking about the time from Jesus' ascension up through now. That there was a way, and when, when the Bible in many places, and it refers to the later times, it's talking about in some places everything that happened after the ascension of Christ. Okay? That we're, we've been in the later times for a couple of thousand years now. We know that because Hebrews says long ago at many times and in many ways God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. And then he says, but in these last days he has spoken to us by his son whom he appointed the heir of all things through whom also he created the world. So we look at verse 1 and it simply means that since the birth of the church, since Jesus ascended in heaven, Pentecost has preached the birth of the church, there have always been false teachers that have infiltrated the church and until Jesus comes back that will always be the case so you can never let your guard down. There's never going to be a time false teachers will not begin to spring up from within the church. And what's the most, I think, confusing and frustrating thing about people today is we look and we know what the enemies are like from a cultural standpoint. We know where people disagree with us culturally. But all of a sudden these people start to come up within the context of what we might call the church or evangelicalism or orthodox Christianity and we are flabbergasted. And even I have been shocked. And then we're reminded this should not shock us. This is the way it's always been. Paul, in Acts, when he's preaching to the Ephesian elders, he said, wolves will rise up from among you. He's talking to the pastors. And he's saying, from among you, false teachers are going to rise up. So the church always has to be on guard. Next, the origin and the spiritual nature of the heresy is identified. It comes from deceitful spirits and teachings of demons. Like all wickedness and sin, false teaching has a spiritual source. Before false teaching enters the head of a man, the heart of a man, or the life of the church, it is born in the pits of hell. That is the, the place where false teaching and false doctrine is born. And that's why Ephesians 6 reminds us that we do not struggle against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. And this is why false teaching and I'm going to get more specific on what I mean by false teaching as we move forward, but false teaching, I would say, at least here, hear me, that is directly confrontational of the gospel itself, okay, and gets to the root of the gospel itself, has to be rooted out very, very quickly because it's dangerous. And if the devil prowls around like a roaring lion seeking to destroy us, as 1 Peter says, the way he prowls around and seeks to destroy churches from within is false teaching and false doctrine. And so we have to be aware that that's the source of where this comes from. It cannot be played around. It is poison. It is not okay to drink a little bit of it. It will kill you. And this is why one commentator summarized the first two points this way. He said the problem here was doctrinal in nature and demonic in origin. It was doctrinal in nature and demonic in origin. In verse 2, we get a glimpse of the nature and the character of the false teachers themselves, which we've actually already seen in verse 1. Uh, of chapter 1. Verse 2 says, Through the insincerity of liars whose consciences are seared. This is how the false teaching is creeping into the church and making progress. It's through these type of people. They are incapable, apart from the great work of grace of God in their heart, to repent of their sins and to either be saved because they never really were saved or to come back to the truth because they, their consciences have been seared. They can no longer feel conviction anymore. Verse 1 says they departed from the faith. And the language here is really the same language used in chapter 1, verses 4 through 6 of these false teachers, where it says that they devoted themselves to myths and endless genealogies, which promote speculations rather than the stewardship from God, which is by faith. There he's dealing with the gospel. And that they have wandered into vain discussion. They desire to be teachers of the law, so they're seeking status without understanding either what they are saying or the, or the things about which they make confident assertions. Basically, Paul says these teachers are doctrinally wrong, they are hard-headed, they are hard-hearted, they are arrogant, and what they really desire at the end of the day is just to have people follow them. That's really what they're seeking. They want to be able to say they have a following, they have a name for themselves, that people know who they are, and they can say they have a flock that follows them. And then verse 3 gives us the specifics of the false teaching itself. 
Verse 3 says, They forbid marriage and require abstinence from foods that God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. So the two primary issues specifically that's being dealt with here were that these false teachers were telling the people there are certain foods you can't eat, okay, and you should not be getting married because marriage means physical intimacy, and that's, it's wrong to enjoy physical intimacy in the context of marriage. Now, the reason they were teaching this was he was combating a heresy at the time that was common called Gnosticism. And one of the elements of Gnosticism was that the physical world is bad. And so these teachers are saying, since the physical world is bad, there are certain foods that are really good, you can't have them. Because that makes you unholy or unrighteous to enjoy them. Okay? And since the physical world is bad, world is bad physical intimacy, even in the context of marriage, is bad. And they would even teach that to those that were, so they would forbid marriage. They would even teach to those that were already married, if you're married, okay, the, the, the only reason for physical intimacy is for procreation. It's not, you're not allowed to get any kind of spiritual enjoyment out of it, physical enjoyment out of it, it's just for procreation, all right? It wouldn't take me long right there to kick them right out, all right? So that's what he's saying. Now, here's the other reason that's a problem. Due to the fact they believed the physical world was evil, this led to a denial of Jesus in the flesh. This is where it starts to hit the gospel, really. It's already bad enough they say you have to do things or not do certain things to be made righteous before God. But now, because the physical world, as far as they're concerned, is evil, now you're going, we're going to say, well, then Jesus couldn't have come in the flesh because the flesh is evil. So they were denying the humanity of Christ. By the way, most all of the early church heresies denied the humanity of Christ, not the deity of Christ, which actually, in a weird way, I think I've told you before, validates the deity of Christ. Because those closest to Jesus, who knew the most about his ministry and had even experienced it and heard about it and all he had done, they had no problem believing he was divine. They couldn't believe he was human. Now, 2,000 years removed, we think, well, he couldn't have been divine, he had to be human, just human. No, the heresy back then was they denied his humanity. It's why if you look at, for example, the Apostles' Creed and you read the middle section of the Apostles' Creed, it goes into great detail on his humanity because that's what was being denied here. And so this was what they were teaching, and we'll see later why this was an affront to the gospel. It wasn't just they were saying you can't have certain foods and marriage isn't a great idea. There were real gospel implications to what was happening here and what was being taught. And that's why Paul told Timothy, you have to stand up to this. So how does he stand up to it? Well, he does so by teaching the truth. He moves from identifying the heresy and then calls Timothy to teach the truth. He begins in verse 3 by telling and teaching what the truth is. And he says, the truth is that these things were created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. And then in verse 4 and 5, he continues, For everything created by God is good, and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving, for it is made holy by the word of God and prayer. So Paul just doesn't tell Timothy, hey, you have to accuse these people of false teaching. He tells them why it's false, and then he says, here is the truth. And the first place he goes back is to creation itself. He says, it is good. Does that sound familiar to anybody? That's straight out of Genesis 1. Every time God creates, after every day, he says, it is good. I'm creating the physical world. It is good. And then he completes all his creation, and he says, it is very good. Now, sin may have tainted God's creation, and it's been damaged by sin, but physical matter was God's idea. So it's not inherently evil. It can be accepted, and it can be enjoyed when it's done so with God's original intent. And that's where he says nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving for it is made holy by the word of God. So what does this mean? Simply put, it means that God, that anything God created, specifically here, uh, food and physical intimacy can be accepted and enjoyed as long as it is recognized as a good gift from God and thanks has been given for it. This is probably where we get the traditional blessing before the meal. That when you sit down to pray, why do you pray? You ever think about why you do it? It's a recognition of God's goodness. That what we're about to receive is from God's hand. And I'm going to enjoy this steak and this baked potato. And I might even enjoy my salad a little bit. If, because it comes from the hand of God. And that's why we do that, to recognize. And so it's good to eat. Physical intimacy within the context of God. 
a marriage. Have you ever thought why we do a wedding ceremony? Why do we do a wedding ceremony? Is it just because that's the way you should do things? No, a wedding ceremony is to recognize that this marriage that is happening is good. And all that comes from it is a gift. And it's a pause to recognize that this relationship and everything that will happen in the context of this relationship, that God has given freedom in this relationship, is a good thing. And so it's not that we make it holy by praying over our food or we make it holy by, by having a wedding ceremony. It's good because God created it already. It is the recognition of it. And so as Christians, we need to be recognizing all of the goodness that God has given us. It means that without guilt, we can enjoy good food and physical intimacy within the context of marriage. We can enjoy the warmth of the sun. We can enjoy the comfort of a hug that someone gives us when we need encouragement. So Paul told Timothy to identify the heresy and then confront it by teaching truth. Now, as you grow in your faith, you're going to come in contact with new teachings. Okay, now there are two types of new teachings. The first new teaching is that which is true, but you've never considered it before. Somebody introduces a topic to you in a Bible study, you read through some systematic theology, something you've never heard about before, but is biblically true. By new, it just means it's new to you. Okay, it doesn't mean it's just been invented. It just means it's new to you, and that's healthy, and you should pursue those things and read God's Word in relation to those things and form your theology, and, and that's all good, and that's healthy, okay? It's, it's not new in the sense it's recent. It's just new to you, all right? But then there are teachings, and this is what you have to be careful of. These new teachings are what we might call recently invented. In other words, they're doctrines invented by men. They're falsehoods. They're to be rejected. Well, how do we tell the difference? We're called in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 19 to 22. Listen to what Paul says. He says, Do not quench the spirit. Do not despise prophecies. But test everything. Hold fast what is good. Abstain from every form of evil. So when we hear something that is new, what is the process we go through? We don't quench the spirit. In other words, we don't necessarily put the, put the kibosh on it and say, No, we're not going to deal with this. This is new. I've never heard this. This is foreign. You test it. Well, is this the teaching of the Bible? Is this what God says is true? Of course, the Bible is the litmus test, and that's the standard that we hold things up to. And then, after testing it, we can abstain from every form of evil. That can be moral or doctrinal. Okay, And I would even say attitude falls into that. The way we conduct ourselves mentally and our hearts and our, and our emotions and how we feel about things, we can know, is it right or is it not right by Scripture? Now, this brings us to this point, which I've already mentioned here, when it comes to identifying false teachers and false teachings in the church today, Paul says the Spirit expressly told him these things. All right? Well, we're not apostles, we're not prophets, but we do have the Bible. And the Bible is written by the Spirit. And so where the Bible says this is truth, we can say with confidence the Spirit expressly says these things. We can say with as much confidence as Paul had as an apostle, when we read the truth of Scripture, this is the Spirit talking. And this is why the Bible is our standard. Or, as you might have heard in Old Testament prophets, thus saith the Lord. The Bible has spoken on this issue. God has spoken on this issue. So we are not left handicapped by how do we know the truth. We have that which was being put together as Paul writes these things back then. The Spirit speaks to the apostles and speaks to the prophets, but today... We say when we confront false heresy or, or heresy or false doctrine, and somebody says, well, how do you know that's false? We can say the Bible says, the Spirit expressly says or expressly teaches this in His Word. Now, moving on, let's look at the jobs of pastors here. So what's the pastor's job? Pastors are promoters of truth. This is what he tells Timothy in verses 6 through 8. He says, if you put these things before the brothers, you will be a good servant of Christ Jesus being trained in the words of faith and of the good doctrine that you have followed. Have nothing to do with irreverent, silly myths. Rather, train yourself for godliness, for while bodily training is of some value, godliness is of value in every way and holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. So he tells Timothy to teach the truth or put the truth before the church for at least a couple of different reasons. First, for the instruction of the church. He says in verse 6, if you put these things before the brothers, you will be a good servant of Jesus Christ. What defined whether or not Timothy's ministry 
to Ephesus was successful or not. It was te- whether or not he taught the truth. You see that again taught in 2 Timothy chapter 4, specifically verses 1 through 3, where he tells Timothy, Paul writes to Timothy, teach the word, preach the word in season and out of season. That whether or not he was a successful pastor or whether or not he was a successful follower or servant of Jesus had nothing to do with how the people responded to what he said. It had everything to do with the content of what he said. He tells them to get, he says, get the church back to these things. And one of the ways he does that, he says, if you put these before the church, put these things before the church, you'll be a good servant. So Timothy is receiving this revelation from Paul as an apostle writing. And he doesn't just tell Timothy, hey, you need to know this. He says, you need to know this, and then you need to put it out there to the church. So whatever Timothy was getting in the form of revelation and instruction by Paul, his job was not to hold it to himself. His job was to pass it along to others. We see this in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, where Paul told Timothy, If then, my child... You then, my child, I'm sorry, be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses entrust to faithful men, and it doesn't stop there, who will then be able to teach others also. In one verse there, you have four generations of doctrinal teaching. You have Paul, who then teaches Timothy, who's supposed to teach it to other men, who then those men are supposed to teach it to other men. One verse, four generations, that the that the truth of Scripture and the gospel is supposed to be passed down from generation to generation among Christians. One of my main pastoral philosophies is I learn to teach. Okay, I learn to help others learn. If I'm reading an article, studying for a sermon, listening to a podcast, whatever it might be, automatically in my brain, and it may just be the way I'm wired, because I can't say I've made an intentional decision to do this, but it is kind of the way I'm wired. I'm already thinking two things. How do I teach this and to whom do I teach this? How do I teach this and in what context? Is this something I need to bring up on a Sunday morning? Is this something I need to maybe teach a small group on? Is this something I need to encourage our church to go in a direction of? Is this something I just need to have a conversation with someone specifically about because of the nature of it? But I learn... To teach, which is, and this, by the way, just isn't scripture. If you know me, about anything that I learn to do, uh, I'm always thinking, how do I teach somebody else to do this? How do I pass this along to someone else? And this is what Paul was telling Timothy, instruct the church. Just the other day, I was having lunch with some pastors, and we meet every, I don't know, three to six months, a few of us, this particular group. And one of the questions we always ask is, what are you preaching through? So I told him, I'm preaching through 1 Timothy. The question always comes up with there, why? You know, some pastors will say, well, we're entering this kind of discipleship life in our church and we're preaching toward this. And sometimes that is the case with me. Sometimes I can give a closer reason. But this time I said, why are you preaching 1 Timothy? And I said, well, because it wasn't that long ago, I went through it myself for my own personal devotion. And I figured, well, they need to know this too. Now, that's, I, I, I can't think of a, of a book of the Bible that I've preached to you that I haven't first walked through myself. And by the way, it can be very, very frustrating at times from a personal devotion standpoint because it's very hard to do personal devotions and not outline sermons in your head, okay? Which I have to be careful of because I need a devotional life just like everybody else. But I am, that's kind of what's going in my head. That's part of what a pastor does. It's, it's some pastors actually, and I don't necessarily agree with this philosophy, but I think, I don't want to, I don't want to, uh, misrepresent him, but I think this is John MacArthur's sort of philosophy in his preaching, which I have no problem with for him. It's not really the way I I do things. Um, But he actually makes the point that he's doing his own personal devotion as he's studying through the scriptures. He prays through it. He applies it through his own life as he's walking through of how to apply it to his church's life, which I think is actually a good representation of what Paul is telling Timothy here. So pastors are to promote truth for the benefit of the church as a whole. What they learn, they're to instruct others. This is why you get articles from me and emails and things to view and because I want you as informed as possible. I don't, if I learn it, chances are at some point you need to know it. To me, it's just a matter of organizing it in my head and the timing of it. All right? But there's a second benefit to this, and that is pastors strengthen themselves. So as a pastor learns to train others, he's also training himself. Now, personal trainers will tell you this. 
personal physical trainers, they would tell you they may go somewhere and they may learn a new technique, okay, to help to, to, uh, to add to their, you know, their regimen when it comes to training others. And the first thing they would tell you they do is they implement that technique in their own life for a while, okay? And what are they doing? They're learning it. Well, the whole time they're learning it, what are they doing? They're benefiting themselves. They're growing healthier. They're benefiting themselves. Then they pass it on to others, but they get the first blessing. If you're a teacher in any way in the church, it doesn't matter if you're teaching two-year-olds, you know, all the way up to our senior adults, okay? You understand the fact, and this is one of the reasons I tell you, if you think you may have the gift of teaching, there's a spiritual benefit to it. You get the first blessing when it comes to preparing for the lesson, okay? Because you're learning it first, and you're chewing on it first and trying to apply it to your own life. And I might even go as far as saying, the younger age you teach, you, the, the more you may learn. And do you know why? Because you have to figure out, how do I take these truths that are way beyond my ability to explain, but try to put them in a way that a four-year-old or a six-year-old can understand? And it forces you to think through them. So there's this benefit of teaching God's Word that comes from being a teacher that hits you first. Anything that I learn to teach you, I get the blessing of it first. I get the benefit of it first. And Paul is very clear with Timothy about this. He tells him, you will get the benefit of it. Put these things before the brothers, because if you do, you'll be a good servant. And you'll be trained in the words of faith and of good doctrine. And then he tells them to have nothing to do with irreverent, silly myths, but train himself for godliness. He actually uses the idea of physical, personal training to make his point. Having warned Timothy to have nothing to do with these myths and these silly teachings, he says, rather, or instead, Train yourself for godliness. And the word train in the Greek is the same word we get our word gymnasium from. Paul is using an athletic metaphor because athletes or athlete, athletics were uh, really a big deal in the Roman culture, much like they are in our culture. So he's saying, listen, just as you train and you see people train physically, you need to be training spiritually. And then he tells him why. While bodily training is of some value, and it is, Godliness is of value in every way, and it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. So it's not that physical training is bad. Of course it's not. We all know it's good. It's just limited. It doesn't matter how well you eat or how well you train. Two things are sure to happen. You're going to get old and you're going to die. Nothing you can do about either one of those. All right? I don't care how healthy you eat. I don't care what you eat. I don't care how much you exercise. You will get old. Your body will not even be able to process the exercise like it used to, and you will die. All right, so Paul just says it's good, but it's limited. So why don't we put our efforts, he tells Timothy, on what is not limited? And that the sanctification process culminates in eternity with our eventual glorification, so it's good for the future and it's good for now. Our spiritual training will equip us to share the gospel with others, teach others to follow Jesus that is never going to get old, that doesn't have time limitations, and even when we die... It has been official for that in the part that that is part of the process, the sanctification process that God has been leading us to get us ready for the glorification process. So Paul wanted Timothy to teach the truth because it would instruct the church and at the same time it would continually teach Timothy. He also told Timothy just a few verses later, which we'll look at next week in chapter 4 verse 16, he tells him to keep a close watch on yourself, on your life, and your teaching or your doctrine. Persist in these. For by doing so, you will save both yourself and your hearers. So there he is again telling Timothy, focus on your life and your doctrine because it has benefits for you and it has benefits for others. So this is why the teaching ministry of the church and specifically the teaching ministry of the pastor is the most important part of the pastor's role. It is the most important part of what he does. It's also why... I would argue expositional preaching, book by book, verse by verse, is the best method. It's not the only method, okay? I think there can be others, but I think it's the best because it ensures there will be a consistent, non-biased diet of doctrinal and moral teaching in the church. This steady diet minimizes the likelihood of false teaching taking root and damaging the church, and it minimizes that the pastor himself will fall into false teaching because he is studying through Scripture on a regular basis, systematically, 
Uh, and it ensures that what the church hears is not going to be the pastor's opinion, and he's not going to preach his agenda for that month, that in fact he's just going to pick up and come back to where he was the week before and start with the authority of Scripture. So this consistent diet of doctrinal maintenance is very important, primarily through the teaching ministry of the church. Now, I live in the suburbs, so I see a lot of people's yards, okay? And I watch how they take care of their yards, all right? Now, my philosophy is you wait till the dandelions show up in April, and then you attack them with everything you got, all right? I mean, you attack them. I know the little stuff you mix up says, you know, set the setting to 2.5 ounces for the, what you're putting in there. Oh, no, I go to five. We're going to five. These babies are not, these, they are not coming back, all right? It is an all-out war. And so I'm spending time and money trying to get the, the yard to look like it's supposed to over this, this period of, of time, you know, in, in the spring where they all of a sudden pop up. But then I watch my other neighbors, all right? And some of them, they work on their yard all year, okay, in the fall. They're putting out feed and seed and stuff to kill dandelions. I'm like, they're not even showing up till April. Why are you doing it now? Where well, they're prepping their yard. Then they have these nice green yards that they, they just mow occasionally or they're doing other work in the yard to keep it, keep it going. Some of them have companies come out and treat the yard throughout the year. Okay? Why? Because of the ongoing maintenance ensures that when April rolls around, they're not going to look out of their yard one day and have half a million dandelions staring at them. All right? Me, here they come all at once. All right? Well, what consistent teaching does in the church is this ongoing, sometimes in season and out of season, is it ensures that you're not going to look out in the church one day and all of a sudden all these false theologies and all this heresies kind of all of a sudden cropped up in the church. Now, it doesn't mean that a dandelion, a false teaching, won't pop up here and now, but it's a lot easier to go out and take, take the little spray bottle and spray that one time and kill it than it is to try and treat a bunch at one time. Now, I can treat my yard... In a day, usually it lasts for the year, if I do it correctly. Heresy does not get weeded out of the church that quickly. It just doesn't, which is why we have to be much more careful. Because once false doctrine and false theology start to pop up in the church, one by one, there's one after the other, you will find out that underneath, and many times they are all related. And they usually all go back to two core items, which I'll tell you again here at the end, and that is the nature of the gospel and the nature of Scripture. Those, those two things, when they are denied or they are minimized, you're asking for trouble. What, the God, what preaching and teaching consistently does is it makes sure that the Bible is always the authority and it's highlighted, and the gospel is all over the Bible. You can't preach through a book of the Bible without seeing the gospel. Let me say two other things very quickly before we move on, and that is from a personal perspective, I can give testimony to Paul's point that there is great accountability for me as a pastor in teaching regularly. The blessing comes to me first because I get to learn these things before I teach them to you. And so there's great accountability to sit down with God's Word week in and week out, especially with everything going on in the culture and hearing all voices come from different ways to know that I sit down every week and go, oh, and I'm just reminded constantly over and over and over. Uh, of staying true to God's word. Second, while the text is primarily meant for pastors, I would remind you that as a follower of Jesus, it applies to everybody and that everybody is a disciple and everybody's teaching somebody else. Now, this can be parents teaching their children or grandparents teaching their grandchildren or friends who get together who teach each other. But your spiritual growth matters. And so you're learning for the purpose of sharing with someone else, lest you become a spiritual couch potato. Well, I just learn and soak it in, and I just love to know all these things about Jesus, but there's, there's no outflow of your life. You're not investing anybody. You're not talking with your friends about what you've learned. You're not sharing with anybody. You're not asking questions and with, to, to help somebody else grow spiritually. And this is why you should prioritize your spiritual help over physical health. Let me ask this question. How much healthier would churches be if Christians took as seriously their spiritual health as they do their physical health? Now, again, physical health and being physically fit is great, and it's fine, and the body is God's temple, and you should take care of it. Having said that, what if we cut out the junk food in our lives, the television, the media, the social media, all the newscasts, what if we cut that out like we did chocolate, unhealthy foods? I know chocolate. Let me take a step back. You know, But what if we cut that out? What if we were as passionate about cutting that junk food out, spiritual junk food, as we are the junk food in our lives? 
What if Christians made a commitment, especially ones who care about the physical health, and said, I will not exercise today until I'm in God's Word. I will not work out today until I read the Bible and have my time with the Lord. How much better off, how much spiritually healthy would churches if we were that committed? We need to say, I will get rid of all the unhealthy and overindulgence junk food of the things the world offers. And likewise, I will be disciplined in my daily Bible time and my daily prayer life for the purpose of godliness. False teachers are pawns of Satan. Pastors are promoters of truth. And then Paul reminds us that Jesus is the only hope. So now Paul corrects the false teaching in verses 9 and 10 with a, a deeper, and what we get to the core of the matter here, and that is what was being attacked in Ephesus was the gospel itself. This was not a disagreement on a secondary issue. This wasn't a disagreement on eschatology. It was not a disagreement between evangelicals on do we sprinkle babies or do we baptize them. Based, like There's a debate between Baptists and conservatives, Presbyterians. There's not a debate here over church government. Should we be congregational? Should we be Episcopal? Should we, you know, should we be a Presbyterian form of church government? These are all things that separate people by denominations. Uh, they separate sometimes even brothers and sisters in Christ who just agree to disagree on certain issues. This was a core issue with the gospel, which is why he deal with, deals with it. Paul says in verses 9 and 10, the saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance. For to this end we toil and strive because we have hope set on the living God who is the Savior of all people, especially of those who believe. So when he writes of toiling and striving, he is not talking about working to gain salvation here because he clearly says that his hope is set on the living God. All right? What he's saying here is he's referring to his ministry and the ministry himself and how he toils and strives to work hard for the kingdom to make inroads into unreached places to share the gospel with others even to live a godly life as a demonstration of what Christ has done and done in them and then he says that God is the savior of all people especially those who believe now he is not saying that God saves everybody this is not teaching universalism one of the reasons we know that is because he, he separates into two different categories right here he says especially those so somehow he's dividing two different categories now, there's a couple of different ways people read this the first is that basically what Paul was saying is that he's the Savior of all people. That word Savior can also mean the one who takes care of okay, and provides for all people. So he's saying God provides for all humanity. He gives all humanity these things that he had mentioned to others. But he's especially the Savior of those who believe. In other words, the eternity, uh, salvation, uh, is, is, is uh, especially those for those who believe in Christ. Or one translator says he's based, it can be translated like this, that God who is the Savior of all men, that is to be more precise, all who believe. So they believe Paul was just, as he's writing, clarifying himself. He's the Savior of all men, that is to those who believe. But clearly he's pointing here to the necessity of the gospel because these people are saying you have to do this to be righteous and you can't have this and you can't take part uh, in this, and the, and the physical world is bad. And Paul says, no, that's not it at all. That's not it at all. God himself, through Christ, is the Savior. And he says, it's, this is a trustworthy saying. You're not saved by your actions or your deeds. You're not saved by what you eat or don't eat. But you're saved by God himself, only through Christ. He, he preached this message to the Jews and the Gentiles. You're saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in, in Christ alone, in anything that contradicts this message, which is what happened where Timothy was the pastor, was to be dealt with swiftly and without compromise. Where the gospel was attacked, Paul went to immediately. Now, there are times he told Christians, you need to compromise on this. Acts 15, the apostles are gathered, and they're trying to figure out how to get the Gentiles into the church. And they're like, look, we need to come in an agreement on what we're going to do and not do. 1 Corinthians 8 through 10, you have all the freedom and Christian liberty things. And if you're eating... At somebody's house and they don't want you eating food, sacrifice to idols, don't do it. You need to, you know, uh, be sensitive to other people. He said, but the gospel you don't compromise on. Okay, there, there's no compromise with the gospel. The text I read earlier, I'll read part of it again. Galatians 1, I'll read 6 through 10, and I'll also read chapter 2, verse 21, says this. I'm astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. The gospel would not have been Galatia that wrong, and Paul says, I am shocked you've left it already. Not that there's another one, 
but there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel. The word there actually means pervert the gospel. And he says, But even if we are an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to one we preach to you, let him be eternally cursed or eternally damned, some translations would say. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you receive, let him be accursed. And then worried, some people may say, well, Paul, aren't you worried about what people think? I mean, this is not going to be a popular message. And he says in verse 10, for am I now seeking the approval of man or of God? Or am I trying to please man? If I were still trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. I do not nullify the grace of God, for if righteousness were the law, were through the law, then Christ died for no purpose. Paul says this is not a small deal. It is not a small deal to add to the gospel. It is not a small deal to take away from the glory of Christ by saying we have to do something in order or accomplish something in order to put our faith in Christ and to be accepted by him. It's by faith alone and what Christ has accomplished alone. If you were to ask me whether the top theological priorities in the church today, I would start with these. And they'd probably be 1A and 1B, the gospel and the inerrancy of Scripture. We, we have to start any discussion I'm going to have with anybody on any moral or doctrinal issue. We're going to start right there. Okay? And I say 1 and 2, 1A and 1B. I'd probably put the gospel as the highest, but we get the gospel from the inerrancy of Scripture. And the reason I put them together is I've never met, and it's not, I guess it's not possible, I've never met anybody that denied the inerrancy of Scripture that eventually did not compromise on the gospel. Now, they may not in the moment, but as they live, you will find when you start doubting the Scripture, which is where we get the gospel, you're going to start doubting everything else. You start doubting whether or not it's possible for a man to get swallowed by a fish and live three days. It, it's only a matter of time before you start questioning whether or not a man can be crucified and be raised from the dead three days later. It's, it's going to come down the road. But then the gospel, what, what defines how we're reconciled with Christ is the other big issue. And we have to agree on that. Okay, and I'm, we agree on a lot of different things as Baptists and as Grace Baptist Church. We have a doctrinal statement that goes more specifically because we're going to disagree with other evangelicals and what we might call some of these other secondary issues. But, but the gospel basically delineates who's okay or right with God and redeemed by God and who's not, who's facing God's blessings in eternity and who's facing God's wrath. And dividing line is the gospel, which is why you have to get that right. So I, depending on my role, who I'm talking to, the context, I can have discussions and debates within a lot of different settings on secondary issues, what's going on in certain denominations, is that a big deal, is it not a big deal? But before we start there, we're going to have to get the gospel right, and we're going to have to agree on the nature of Scripture because that's got to be our authority. Years ago, when I was at another church in North Carolina, our church was had taken part in several churches that were working together to you know, work together in the community, okay, for the purposes of Christ. So I went to the meeting one day because the pastor couldn't be there. And one of the things I told the pastor was, I'm a little concerned we don't have a basic doctrinal statement, okay? And he said, well, bring it up. So I did. And I said, if we're going to work together and we're going to have joint worship services and we're going to have social ministries where we feed people, all that's great, can we come up with some kind of basic doctrinal statement that says where we stand on at least two issues, where we stand on the inerrant, or on Scripture, the nature of Scripture, okay, and, where, and the nature, it doesn't mean we have to agree with every specific interpretation. We've talked about this as we've gone through First Timothy. We may disagree on a couple things here, but at least can we agree the Bible's inerrant, authoritative, it's sufficient for everything that it's written for and, and, and directs us to. And yes, you know, can we do that? And can we have a statement on what the gospel is. And I threw those things out there, and yeah, th those will work. And they said, no. They said, we have decided not to make theology an issue. And I said, how can you not make theology an issue? You can't even agree on the God you're worshiping to unless you make theology an issue. Now, there were churches of different denominations in this group. I was willing to work with them for other, you know, purposes, okay, even though we would disagree on some other issues. But if we're not in agreement on the gospel, and we're not in agreement on the, the, the nature of the Bible, and the answer of Scripture, that's where we stop. That's where we stop. 
I say that because as a church, we have a doctrinal statement. You are welcome to it anytime you want. It's public. You can email me. I'll email you a copy of it. It's in our bylaws. We have said as a church, we agree on these issues. They're specific to us as Grace Baptist Church and to us as Baptists. Okay? But you have friends who claim to be believers, who claim to be hold different beliefs. And you say, well, when I talk to these people, where do I start? Where do I start to see if we're even on the same page? You start with those two issues, the gospel and the inerrancy of Scripture. When I was a youth pastor and kids went off to college, they're like, how do we choose a church? So the first thing you do, as I said, you ask the pastor, what's his view on the gospel and what's his view on Scripture? And if he can't answer both of those in under about 30 seconds, you hit the door and you never come back. Because that, that's, those aren't hard questions. Okay, those are easy questions. And if you get hymns and halls about that, don't even step foot in the door again. And so the church has to be on constant guard to protect the gospel. That's why we teach. That's why we continue to teach, to be reminded so we don't get led astray. We can work through practical issues and have practical studies and things of that nature. But at the end of the day, we keep teaching the gospel and keep teaching the Bible over and over to protect ourselves from being in the situation which Timothy had found himself is, and that was a church where false teachers had already begun to creep in. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for the truth of your word, that we can rely on it. Lord, that it meets us where our deepest needs are. Father, there are many needs that we have that we don't really have. We think we do, but your word meets us at our deepest need. Thank you for the clarity of all things in your word of the gospel that we are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, that the work has been completed by Christ, God himself in the flesh, the God-man, 100% God, 100% man, dying on the cross, being the substitute for our sins, being buried, being physically raised from the dead, ascending into heaven, sitting at the right hand of the Father today, mediating on behalf of those who have put their faith in him, that this is the gospel, and he will return. He is the righteous judge. He is the one who would judge all mankind. Help us to remain focused on that. Father, keep us close to your word because we know that as you keep us close to your word, you keep us close to truth and the gospel. You keep us from straying too far as your word draws us back to itself. And every time we feel ourselves tempted to stray morally or in our attitude or our thinking or whether we're going to stray in some way doctrinally, your word pulls us back to truth. Protect us as individuals, as families, and as a church from compromise or doctrinal error. Give us grace as we talk to those who think they may know the gospel but do not, that we might, because of our knowledge of the gospel, which has come to us by grace, not because we're better than anybody else, we might share with them the truth of what the gospel is. Lord, where we have brothers and sisters in Christ who we're going to disagree with issues about, where we can agree with them on the gospel and the nature of Scripture, Lord, that we would celebrate that. And we might even have to take a stand and say, we're just going to disagree or agree to disagree on these issues. And they may be strong stands. Let us not be haughty or arrogant on these things. And by all means, Lord, let us get the gospel right. Lord, we are grateful for a righteous judge. You will settle all of this in the end. Our task is to stay as close to you as possible with humility to follow you, to listen to others, but yet to, to, Lord, to test what they say so that we might not be led astray. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. If you go ahead and stand, I'm going to be standing here at the front for just a moment. If I can pray with you in any way or help you in any way, I'd be glad to do that at this time. <laughs> Yeah. 
Andy's going to come up here and make a few more announcements, but I wanted to uh, bring your attention to this uh, as utmost importance. Two weeks from yesterday, we are doing a community Easter egg hunt. We had about 300 flyers go out to our community. So this is something people know is going to happen. This is kind of an all-hands-on-deck thing. So on April 1st, we're not fooling you. This is really going to happen. On April 1st, if you do not have anything planned uh, that day, we need you. Okay, just to be real frank, unless you've got something already on the calendar, go ahead and block this spot off. We need you. There's a sign-up sheet in the lobby. We're going to need people to work tables, and we're also going to just need people to kind of mingle and help guests. There are supplies that we need. Make sure you read that. Uh, so this is really, really important. If the community is going to show up and take part in this, we want to make sure we serve them well. Okay, so go ahead and write that down on your calendar. As you leave today, I will be standing out of the way of the sign-up sheet so you can line up and get in line to sign up. Uh, make sure you go shopping and get some of these uh, supplies. If you have any questions, uh, please see Lindsay uh, or Kelly Harrison. Is she in here? Okay, she's in Children's Church, but see one of them to give more specifics, but we definitely need you to be a part of that. Andy, if you come up and finish up the announcements and close us in prayer. Yeah, um, also, this Tuesday, we got Mama's Hope uh, coming up. We need your help there, 530. Um, we need help help with that. So volunteer, get to meet these ladies and their families that come in and, uh, and, and need help. And then uh, youth, we got our laser tag event coming up on Saturday. We'll be here at 1.30. Uh, cost $12. If you got any questions, see me. And then uh, save the date. Uh, our spring dinner is coming up on the 16th. Uh, so save the date for that. So directly after the service on the 16th. And then our getting to know grace classes are on the 16th and 23rd as well. The time, 1.30 to 3.30 for those. So let me pray and uh, we'll be dismissed for the day. Heavenly Father, I just uh, thank you for your grace and mercy, Lord. Thank you for sending your son Jesus to die on the cross for us. Lord, thank you for being king over all. God, help us to fight heresy. Help us to fight the good fight of faith, Lord. And help us to love you with all of our heart, mind, body, and soul. And I say it's in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen.